but I believe uh, extra, there are reptile alien aliens here because of my own personal research. I have been in the company of at least eight people uh, over my over the past many years, eight different people. Each one is extraordinarily well-grounded people. Airline pilot, one uh, with a major airlines, uh, a very wealthy man in Las Vegas who buys and sells commercial hotels, buildings, etc. Extremely wealthy man, uh, Christian, incidentally, very Christian man, but very, very wealthy, a very highly intelligent man, sat down and told me about his personal one-on-one -on -one with a reptile alien in which many others in his church were privy to see. That's a whole story in itself. That happened in, in Colorado. Uh, and then to have a scientist um, and, and, a, and a young lady who was one of my favorite people in the world, a young lady called Nancy. And Nancy just blew the audience away. She is so feminine so incredibly charming and feminine girl talking about stuff that will blow your mind her father was uh, in the air force uh, her family with air force but her father was in charge of project retrievables for the air force the man who was in charge of going out wherever in the world that any extraterrestrial activity he was in charge in the air force to go there first and he was the boss. Is Nancy with us? Yes, she is. Hello, Nancy. <laughs> Hi, George. I'm here. Hi, dear. Uh, how are you doing? Nancy, I uh, I want to tell the audience how much I very much appreciate your friendship and uh, and and our times that we've had together to talk about such things. Because uh, sweet. thank you. Uh, it's such an interesting and important time in which we live. And I believe, as I've said on my program many times, that uh, it's an idea whose time has come for us to publicly begin to talk about the reality of uh, other life forms on this earth, other life forms who have come here from other worlds, possibly, uh, or and or maybe even indigenous life forms who have always been here, but we just don't see them. And I've heard all kinds of stories, and we've talked a lot about that ourselves. Maybe you could tell the audience something about yourself and you know, how you come to be, who you are, and, and all of your experiences in your past, because they're fascinating stories. I, I doubt in the time <laughs> we have that I would be able to tell them all of them, but... Uh, well, whatever. I can start off at least by telling them that uh, I have had lifelong experiences with um, sightings and and some contact with um, ETs or entities or whatever you want to call them. Mostly brought on by the fact that my father was involved in major military operations involving UFO crash site retrievals during the 1950s and early 60s. And I think when you come from a background like that, it, it has a tendency to tag you, I guess, you know, I, I suppose I feel somewhat like I'm being followed or watched or, um, you know, you, you get to feel a little bit like a lab rat, I guess. I know what you mean. Uh, talk about a little bit, but let them know a little bit about what your father was, who he was and what he was doing. Okay. Um, well, from the earliest age that I can remember, I was born in 1949, um, my dad, gee, he, he started out very early on in the military around uh, just after the turn of the century. He was a lot older than my mother by uh, 25, 30 years. And um, he started out in the cavalry. And that moved on in as the, the military evolved into the Army Air Corps and then into the Army from that branch, the whole time uh, after he got into the Army Air Corps, according to my mother, he was in special operations 
And um, according to her, he, his first experience with any kind of sighting was back in the 1930s off the coast of Greenland. He was on a, uh, a major military vessel offshore, and there was a whole complement of crew aboard. You know, it was in the morning. They were getting ready for their early shifts getting their orders and whatnot. And um, while they were there waiting for their orders for the day, everybody on the ship saw a UFO come up out of the water off the coast of Greenland. And she described the way he described it as being just this kind of an orangish, greenish light that came up relatively close to the ship and then came out of the water at approximately a 45 degree angle and just sped off into space. Now this is a whole crew including you know high ranking military officers and they were all debriefed extensively afterwards and from that experience my father developed a much more keen interest and continued to look into different kinds of phenomenon, especially when he was in Europe undercover um, as a band leader at that time. That's when my mother met him, was right after the, uh, the war ended. And she and he both had some experiences in Germany at the time. And it would be better probably at some point in the future if maybe you had her on and she could tell you in, in detail, you know, what those experiences were. But I was quite interested to find out that there were UFO sightings and, you know, activities during World War II and after World War II. I know my mother had a couple of experiences before she met my father when she was on her way to the concentration camp. Now, my mother wasn't Jewish. She was a Hungarian gypsy, but she, like a lot of the other people that were taken into camps, I mean, there were many different kinds of people, not just Jewish people alone, who were subjected to those kinds of horrors and atrocities. On her way, in one of the boxcars, they were sending her to a place called Theresienstadt in Poland, which luckily for me, otherwise I wouldn't be here, was a work camp and not a death camp. This was approximately 1942 because she was in the camp for three years before she was released by the Americans, or rather, you know, before the Americans came. She actually escaped right as the Americans were coming. Um, anyway, she and a, a bunch of other people were just jam-packed into one of these cattle cars, you know, with the little tiny slits through the... Um, the wood that you could look out and see what was going on. One day when they came to rest at one of the stops that they were at, my mother said everybody saw some form of an unidentified flying object over the, um, the train station and there was just, this was at night and it was just totally, the entire area was lit up as though it was daylight and the train wouldn't move. And it was stuck there for a couple of days. It, it just refused to move after that happened. And eventually, of course, the train moved on and they all ended up in Trajan step. But my mother, you know, comments on various things that the German soldiers were screaming and yelling about when they were outside in, in a panic trying to get away and, and wondering what this thing was. So that was her first experience with uh, a UFO. And when my father found out that she had had experiences, then the two of them kind of started talking more about it, and he eventually decided that when he came back to the United States that he wanted to, to go predominantly into that area of study and research. And he was eventually um, requested to do that because of his various experiences and interests. So in, in terms of that, right after I was born, he started having um, major um, forays out into the desert. Predominantly where we lived was in a, um, an area that was 
almost completely either mountainous or, or desert. The boundaries were from southern Utah to western Colorado, northern Texas, all of New Mexico, uh, the predominant eastern portion of um, Nevada from mid-Nevada towards the east and all of Arizona. So that was his territory. And I remember as a kid, um, we would get these telephone calls in the middle of the night and we'd have to pack up everything and take off. I mean, being a, a, an Army brat is difficult anyway. Uh, an Army family is difficult because you are often just stationed, you know, haphazardly anywhere they might need you. And this was especially true of my father. We always lived in motels. You know, we never had houses, never had pets. I uh, never had any friends when I was a kid. It was a, a pretty lonely life for a child. And then again, you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, at first I wasn't really aware of what was going on. And, you know, it, 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 it seemed kind of interesting that, you know, my dad would point out these pretty little lights in the sky every now and again. But I think up until that point, I was about three, four years old when I remember seeing those, my dad never really said anything to me about them. I'm not sure if that was because he had never actually come into contact with any and, and didn't really know what was in them or, or why they were here or had actually, you know, had a real crash site investigation by that time. But by 1955, um, I know for sure as far as my own experience goes that he absolutely knew what was happening, and my mother says that by 1954 he knew because she also uh, had a, an ET sighting when he actually hit an ET relatively close to a crash site, and she helped him carry it back to the base. Um, but when I was five, I remember very distinctly my father coming into my bedroom around 2 o'clock in the morning. And he took me by the hand, led me out into the living room, and sat me down on the couch with my mother, and told me flat out that, he, and he didn't call them extraterrestrials, he called them uh, creatures. And he said they, act, they absolutely existed, he described what they looked like to me, uh, told me what the spaceships looked like, and then after he told me all of that, he put this little disclaimer on it saying that I could never tell anybody what I knew because it would cause a panic and people wouldn't understand and they might even consider me crazy for having said something or that I was just a kid and I was, you know, making things up or having daydreams or whatnot. But he told me after saying that that he wanted me to know the truth and that it was a truth that I could know but nobody else could know at that point in time because it would cause a panic and I took him very seriously you know I mean my dad was your consummate military man he was so much like John Wayne that John Wayne isn't even as much John Wayne as my dad was he was very dedicated to the military you know his background was such that um, it was the only home that he knew. My dad was half Cherokee Indian and half Irish. And especially at the turn of the century, being any part Indian was not looked upon with a whole lot of uh, goodwill. You know, people thought they were good guides and such, and especially when he was in the cavalry, that, that seemed to come in handy with him. But he wasn't a reservation Indian to start with that people make a lot of judgments about it. And the military was the only place that accepted him for who he was and what he was and gave him a life. And because of that, he became um, hyper-American, I would say. You know, just totally pro-America, pro-anything that the government said. And 
it was very interesting living with a person like that. He was very strong in many, many ways. And yet, as his experiences with the UFOs and his involvement in the investigations dragged out into a number of years, he became much more paranoid. Um, not just about what he was doing, but what could happen to him or to his family from doing it. It was an interesting situation, very interesting situation. <clears throat> you were telling me once about uh, when you were a little girl. I'm sorry, what? You were telling me once a long time ago about the, when you were a little girl. I think you were saying that you were living on the base at the time. And uh, you had an experience where your mom and dad were visiting away. Okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Sure. Um, well, I, I, that kind of ties in with his starting to feel paranoid. Mm -hmm. um, this was 10 years after he actually started uh, doing the researching and the investigations. Now, after he told me what he was doing and that these creatures existed, he didn't really ever talk to me again about it. He talked to my mother about it, and it, it took me years to get my mother to tell me anything, you know, because I was trying to piece things together from memories and, and all of that. And especially since my, dad, my dad's demise is um, such a mystery to us. But as he got more involved towards the 1960s, um, he started talking to my mother about being worried about me because we were always in the desert and, you know, he, he was really paranoid about me being out there all by myself and he would just scream and carry on if she didn't know where I was. And I don't think he ever really talked to her about the import of what his fears were. But uh, later on, she told me that much of it was because what they were finding in these crash sites were a lot of um, children. Uh, a lot of them were hybrid, but many of them weren't. And I think he started thinking that maybe there was a chance that I could be abducted or something because he wasn't sure why they were there. Um, but regardless, you know, he was also worried about himself. and. He used to tell my mother that if he ever went into a military hospital that he might never come out because he knew too much. Now, at first it was very nebulous about what he was saying, but later on it became very, very clear that uh, there were a lot of covert, weird things going on. But in regards to what you were talking about, um, in 1961, I had uh, just graduated from... Uh, this wonderful little school in Gardena, California. And uh, it, it, that seems like a very unusual place to have something like this happen. I would have thought it would happen more you know, out in the desert or something, but it happened in a very densely populated area. We were living in this second-story apartment up on the top, and we kind of had the whole the whole floor up there to ourselves and one day my mom and my dad decided that since I was 11 years old and relatively mature mostly because I was around adults all the time I wasn't around kids I wasn't taken to daydreaming or, or fantasizing or anything like that my dad and my mom decided they, they would leave me alone for the first time in my life just for a little while, half hour to an hour, they were going to run over to my aunt's house and then come right back. Well, I, I assured them I'd be fine, and they left. And um, I went back into my room after having locked the front door and everything. And I turned off the light in the bedroom. I wasn't afraid of the dark. I enjoyed the dark. And I had a little window behind my bed that had some moonlight shining in. So it wasn't totally dark in there anyway. I was just listening to Claire de Lune on the record player. And I think I was probably in there about five minutes or so before I was aware that there was this noise in my bedroom. 
and it was kind of a staticky electricity kind of a noise. Um, but it grew in intensity. And as it became louder, I became more focused on where it was coming from. It was coming from my closet. And it was a relatively good-sized closet, and the door was open. Again, I wasn't taken to nightmares or envisioning monsters or anything like that. I, I was too mature for a little kid, way more mature than most kids would have been considered at the time. And I just kind of sat up in my bed, and I reached over and I turned my record player off because I wanted to make sure it wasn't some static off of my record player. Sure enough, the sound was coming from the closet. And as I watched the closet and the open space that was there, and I could see the different shades of darkness that were there, you know, with the clothes and everything. The noise just got louder and louder and louder. And then all of a sudden, the noise stopped, and there was just a clicking sound. But it was, it was, not, a, um, it was not rhythmic. It was kind of arrhythmic. A couple of clicks, then one, and, and so on. And then there was a shape that just appeared just this shape appeared in my closet and I really stood up and took notice that I didn't actually get out of bed but you know I, I really came to attention and I jumped up on my bed with my knees under me and my feet against the wall and my back against the wall and my hands against the wall and I was just totally pressed back there in a, in a state of tension watching this wide-eyed as this dark shadow appeared in my closet and I realized at the same time that there was no way out of my closet if there was a person in there because that's what I thought it was at first the door was right next to the closet and my, and my door was closed and um, there was only this window behind me and we were on the second story and if I would have jumped out I, I would have probably killed myself it was concrete down below so I just kept my attention on what I was seeing hoping that there was nothing really there and um, to my shock and utter surprise what it was kind of moved out it bent down and moved out and stood straight up and it was taller than my closet I would estimate that the, the ceiling in that particular place was seven, seven and a half feet tall, maybe even a little taller than that. And this entity, this dark form, was almost as tall as the ceiling was. And I just kept my eyes riveted on this thing, and my heart was pounding right out of my chest. And I watched it, and as I watched it, it hunkered down a bit and spread its arms out to both sides. One arm was so close to the door that was to my right and to its left that I knew right then and there that, that I would definitely not be able to get out of the room by that route if I tried, at least not then. And then the other arm was spread out but curved in a little bit more. It looked like it was trying to prevent me from going anywhere. And then I would, became aware of it moving towards me, but it, it moved in such slow increments, I mean, such tiny increments that I, I was hardly even aware of the movement. It's just all of a sudden I would realize it was closer, and then it got closer, and I became more and more frightened because I still didn't know what it was, and it was getting closer, and it looked like it was trying to catch me at that point, and that freaked me out. I was, all kinds of scenarios were running through my head at that time in terms of escape or, you know, what it might try to do, who it was, why it was there. When my parents were coming back, I was alone. It didn't seem like I had any options. I felt like a rat, you know, trapped in a corner. It was a very, very frightening situation for me. And as an 11-year-old kid, you know, that's, um, 
it's really pressing. <laughs> He's trying to find a way out of a, a really what I considered at the time to be a desperate situation. And part of the fear that I felt was just the way it was moving toward me. It was so stealthy. It was like a cat, you know, something wild trying to sneak up ever so gently upon something before pouncing. And, um, and that was extremely scary. As it moved closer, it got about halfway to me, and I couldn't tell you how long this took because I wasn't focusing on time at all. It could have been minutes. It could have been much longer than that. Um, but my body was in increasingly tense, and all of a sudden, part of it came into the, the shadow of the light that was coming through that window, and what I saw, I wasn't prepared to see because this thing was reptilian. It had a totally human form in every respect in terms of, you know, the appendages and, and the configuration on the body and all of that. But I got a very brief glimpse of the side of the face, including one of the eyes and part of the mouth and the hand that was outstretched to the to the left of me and to its right. It had claws and that clicking sound had stopped by the time it got to that part of the bed. And it still was going very slow, but as soon as I saw the fact that it was not a human being, I just totally freaked. Right at that instant, I thought I was lunch, and I just wanted to get out of the room, and I pushed with all of my might against the wall with my feet and my hands, and I bounded off the bed and just scraped by its claws on its left hand. It threw open the door, whipped around the corner, got into the bathroom and locked it. I had all these bedclothes that were tangled around my feet and everything. I was trying to get through them and dragging some of them in with me. Scared to death that this thing was going to get me before I could get away. And as, as soon as I'd locked the door, not thinking that if it could get into my bedroom, it could get into the bathroom. I, I thought I was safe in there. I hunkered down between the wall and the toilet. There was just this very small space, but boy, I... I shoved my little pudgy body in there really fast and just hyperventilated my little life away until I heard kind of a jiggle on the door and yet it wasn't this creature whatever it was was not trying to get into the door and I I thought about it just very briefly and then panicked out because it started making these scratching noises on the outside of the door, just going right from the very top of the door frame all the way down very slowly to the bottom of the door. It did it three or four times. And then I heard the key in the front door and my mother and my father's voice. And they came in and the scratching stopped and I heard my dad call my name and then my mother call my name. I just was so petrified. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I could hardly breathe. I, I didn't know what I had just been through. I couldn't fathom the danger that I was in and I was worried at that point that my mom and my dad were in danger but there was nothing I could do. You know, it was like this little survival mechanism kind of turns on in you and everything else turns off and I just didn't want to I didn't want to be around whatever this was and then as my mother and my father I could hear them walking down the hall calling me and I wasn't answering so they became more frantic and they started screaming at that point and then my father goes oh my god at the top of his lungs and just running down the hallway and my mother is screaming at the top of her lungs for me. They'd both seen. From our front door to the bathroom door was a straight line shot of vision. And um, gosh, how many feet? Maybe 30 feet. 
uh, maybe a little less. But if you just come into the door, you wouldn't notice it until you got a little closer, and then you would have seen it. But anyway, they got to the door, and they looked, you know, they looked in my room first, and I wasn't there. And by that time, I realized, you know, that I could probably get up and everything. I was safe because it was my dad, John Wayne, after all. And if there was anything there, he'd take care of it, hopefully. And then I opened the door. And, I mean, I had tears streaming down my face. I was covered in in tears and shaking so badly I could hardly speak. And when I opened the door, I saw these deep grooves that had been just carved into the door by, by this hand with claws. And it, it had just made curls down to the bottom of the door frame. And it was it was a very, very, very scary and freaky situation made even more um, more intense by my father's reaction to it because he said, That's it. This is over. We're getting out of here. We're moving right now. And we did. We moved immediately after that. And as far as I know, my dad didn't have any more um, investigation calls. It, it's like everything stopped right then and there. We moved down to San Diego. Well, uh, <clears throat> I hadn't heard the whole of the story. Pardon? Some of it. But I had not whole. I had not heard the whole of the story. Uh, uh -huh. We had talked. You just mentioned it in passing, but. That is the kind of uh, subject matter I think that we need to look at because, uh, as I have said on this program before, in the Western tradition of theology and religion, uh, there is <clears throat> the concept, the accepted concept of angels in religion, in both the Jewish and Christian religion, the concept of angels. And as I've said in the past, angel is nothing more than angel. And L was the name for God, and angel meant messenger, so it's a messenger of God, and angels. Uh, we've talked about how the in the Old Testament and New, angels always appeared in forms of men. <clears throat> but there are, and so consequently, I'm saying that in both Jewish and the Christian religion, it makes room for the existence of messengers of God or the messengers of deity. Um, and where do angels come from? Where do the spirit creatures come from? Well, they come from uh, out there in heaven. Well, where is out there? Depends on where you're standing on the earth as to what you're pointing, you know, where, where are you pointing out there? Consequently, as I've said in the past, if you are from here, from the earth, you're terrestrial, and if you're from out there, like angels, then you're extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. And um, with the coming of Zachariah Sitchin's work, uh, where his work is so monumental on the ancient Sumerians, and their talking and their their ancient writings and the ancient peoples of the world talking about the gods who came down and the alien gods who are not of this world, who have come here from another place. And this is all documented from the old Sumerian cuneiform manuscripts and from the ancient Egyptian and from all the other ancient cultures of the world. Oh, absolutely. You know? Every ancient culture that we have has these uh, gods from outer space. Every one. Every one of them. Every yeah. one. You just have to read a lot to to find all the information, but it is there. And there's a lot of it, even more so out there than you would suspect, a lot of doctoral theses, a lot of uh, very scholarly work being done. And any time you get the United States government and world governments involved in the research and the, uh, the research of these things, uh, these subjects, then you know there must be something to it if the military is concerned about it and have people doing research on the subject and they've got uh, special uh, investigators doing this kind of research, then there must be something to it. Oh, absolutely. And when you have, you know, mythological or, or 
mythologically related subjects. I mean, when you're talking about ancient peoples, they had a certain language that they had to deal with in describing what they were seeing. If they didn't have a technological language that was adequate to express um, exactly technology right. Right. of the 20th century or beyond or outer space technology, they would have to relate that to something in their own world. Ergo, you would have things like birds, right. you know, because something flew, or chariots in the sky right. to represent something like a, a UFO. Right, so therefore, uh, this is not a new phenomena that uh, we are given to understand the UFO came into the American consciousness uh, in 1947 with a uh, Roswell incident and that was about the first time that the subject of UFO comes into prominence. In fact, that is not true. In fact, uh, as far back in history as you can go, the, the existence of extraterrestrial and, uh, and alien life forms and otherworldly uh, entities and that kind of subject has always been known to all of the ancient, including the American Indians have just tons of material and, and stories and all of their culture of the American Indians and, as we said, all the other ancients. So there's too much smoke not to be a fire. There's something going on here, and it, uh, the proportions of which are now global, and the implications are absolutely horrendous, and that's what we want to talk about. We can talk about... A, a, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll be going to a break soon. But I did want people to know that there are some very fascinating things going on in the world in which we live. Yes. Okay. Uh, the lady who friend who was with me uh, in the Nevada desert that, that when we had that incident happen was telling me that in Hawaii, and she was from Hawaii, as I said, she was there one night at a party, uh, a beach party, a large group of people. She said probably a couple of hundred people on one of the islands. And um, some, sometime during the late evening, uh, the late hours, they're all kind of quieted down and they're sitting out under a moonlit sky uh, after eating and they're sitting out on the, on the sand. And she said while they were listening to music and, uh, and just relaxing, out in the ocean, the, the moon was out very bright, and she said, and out in the ocean rose out of the water an enormous disc-shaped craft very slowly as it raised up, the water was pouring off of it, and it hovered just about, she said, couldn't have been more than maybe 10 to 15 feet above the surface of the, of the ocean, uh, maybe a half a block to a block out, um, and and the, she said it was fascinating because the water was pouring off of it and everyone could hear it and see it. And uh, once the water had pretty well poured off of it, it just began to uh, aim upwards. The saucer-shaped craft began to aim itself upwards and then boom, took off and was gone. And she said, and everyone on the beach watched it and saw it, and no one could believe what they saw. Everyone saw the same thing, and it came out of the ocean and took off. And then we know uh, that uh, we, we have rec records that uh, when Columbus was coming over here originally, he wrote that, the, uh, that his men and that he and his men would see at nighttime coming through the uh, Caribbean area, that they would see light under the ocean zipping around and that lights would come out of the ocean and zip up straight up into the sky and that's back when Christopher Columbus was supposedly founding this you know this this, this uh, continent and so we're talking a long time ago uh, lights under the ocean uh, coming out of the ocean zipping and going back into the ocean um, so as I said, there's just too much smoke not to be a fire. And I am totally convinced that there is, in fact, a presence on Earth of higher life forms. I do not know where they have come from. Uh, I am totally convinced that if that is true, that there are higher life forms here, and I believe, I believe them to be, 
but I do not believe that they are necessarily uh, uh, meaning us harm uh, for the most part, because if they were a conquering race or if they were here to destroy, we would have already been destroyed a long time ago. Oh, exactly. I mean, logically, why would any race of conquering uh, hordes, you know, wait until you have the technology to destroy them yes. or to even fight them? Right. You know, and why would they have been around in the Pharaoh's time in Egypt? In Samaria and uh, and the Roman times, when the Romans wrote that they and the Greeks wrote about the the the, the uh, shields, the glowing shields that would fly at night, and uh, why would they have stuck around and been around us for so many thousands of years and watched us growing and maturing and uh, and and you know, as you say, growing in technology, if they were going to do something, they would have done it a long time ago. Absolutely. Um, if, if you're reading, you know, and I know you've read just an astounding amount of information in your researches, but just the amount of researching that I've done on it, just about every myth or philosophical discussion that there has ever been in uh, pre-modern times and modern times as well, but if you're talking about, you know, ancient uh, confirmation of, of some sort of entity from outer space, all of these documents attest to the fact that these gods or entities have been very beneficial to the human race, that they have given wisdom and civilization itself and help and, you know, abilities to early man, but okay. there's also, of course, um, information, for instance, from the ancient Sumerian text that there was some possible genetic manipulation going on uh, to create a race of uh, workers that could help these higher intellects, if, if you want to call them that, mm -hmm. um, or beings from outer space in developing the resources or, or taking resources. If you Consider, it for an instance, if you're from outer space and you're coming here for resources, which is most of the scenarios that you read even in the movies, like, you know, Independence Day and everything, they say that these alien creatures come down here for resources. Well, they can only bring a certain amount of people with them in order to get these resources and it you know it, it almost be you to use indigenous life forms to help you out especially if you consider these life forms lesser than you in some respect either physically or intellectually or whatever so there seems to be some evidence to suggest that if, in fact, these aliens came here to help create our civilizations and, and kind of gestate them along gradually, that they also genetically engineered a lot of uh, the indigenous life form. Even in the Bible, you know, there are, there are instances there where they talk about Adam and Eve in the garden and uh, Cain and Abel and, and all of that. And Cain went out and ended up going with the others. Well, who were the others Absolutely. that were out there? He said, don't send me out there. He told us, God, don't Pardon? send me out there because they will get me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, wait exactly. a minute. Exactly, but, Who you know, they that are going to get you? He had to have gone somewhere. There had to have been something there for it to even have existed in that form, in that narrative. Right. It was not just Adam and Eve and their progeny. There was something else out there as well and um, well you know Nancy in particular there's that scripture in Genesis where that's always bothered me but there are many like it but that one particular scripture in Genesis where Abraham uh, is said to be in his uh, standing on the outside of his tent and uh, and three men come walking up the scripture says in Genesis three men approached his camp and he went out to greet them and asked them to please stay and have something to eat with him. 
and he said that, and and they said no, they were too busy. They had something they had to do, but they appreciated it. They thanked him, but they just didn't have time to stop. And then it says, but then he 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 went out of his way and just just would not take no for an answer. And they had to stay to have something to eat. And uh, so they said, all right, well we'll just eat, but we're going to go because we're busy, but we will stay because you insist. And so then it says that he told his wife Sarah to fix them uh, the dinner. Which she did, and it says, and then after after eating, they they thanked him, um, appreciated the, uh, the the hospitality, but they really have to go because they're on their way to do something, and they left. and the, And the scripture says, and this was the Almighty God Himself, the absolute sovereign God Himself, with two companions, two companion angels, mm-hmm. uh, that He had just invited to dinner. There are a number of places in the Bible where it says that uh, various persons have talked with God in person, walked with God physically, and, you know, it brings up a lot of questions. Um, If you are looking at it in terms of beings from another planet or higher life forms, uh, rather than just as a spiritual thing... Mm -hmm. It's just another avenue, you know, another pathway to kind of consider, perhaps. Um, at least I find it very intriguing. Well, I mean, the mere fact that we're told that God said, Come, let us make man in our image. Mm-hmm. And then we are told that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And God said, Come, let us make man in our, in our image and our likeness. Let him become as one of us. You just said, wait a minute, what are you talking about made in the image and likeness of God? And Abraham sat down with a couple, three men that came into camp, fed them dinner, they thanked him, and bid goodbye, and that was Almighty God. Well, then maybe we are made in the image and likeness of God, because Abraham didn't know that that was God himself he was talking to. And so the point being is that, uh, what does that mean, we're made in the image and likeness of God? And then there's another place in there where, uh, in Genesis, where God says to uh, the one of the prophets, he says, um, here man, um, where when he's going to destroy the earth, but he talks about uh, that my spirit will not always abide with man, for he too is flesh. Uh, in other words, he also is flesh. And this is God saying, my spirit's not going to continue with man because he also is flesh. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you mean also? Maybe God was talking, of, you know, God is flesh and, and, uh, and, his, and his association with us is not going to continue because we also are flesh. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to die. Um, there are too many scriptures in, in, in uh, not just the Hebrew and Christian but uh, throughout the whole world that have been intimating that uh, we are the offspring of the gods. Maybe we have been created in the image and the likeness of God or deity. And uh, what does that mean? Well, Well, there are a lot of places in myths and uh, other areas of the Bible also where it says that the, the sons of God married the Oh, yeah. Daughters of men. Right. Right? And, and, and had offspring with the women. And had offspring, which created, in essence, a new kind of, of person. Right. That would be neither God nor man. That's right. But something in between, you know, a totally different entity. Now, to give you just a scenario on that, it's something, because I don't, I don't believe that anything, that any scenario that you can come up with that it hasn't already had a precedent, you know, somewhere, yeah, somewhere or, or an example somewhere in our own world. <clears throat> For instance, when we had the slave trade, when people decided that they wanted to have cotton plantations and sugar plantations. And they wanted to build a country. They wanted to build a country. Um, labor forces were very, um, very modest, right. you know. The... The labor force that existed was a group of people who didn't want to spend their time doing the menial work. You know, they had better things to do. 
And so what they did, they became entrepreneurs, you know, and that, of course, led on to other forms of slave trading and things, which, of course, we all know is totally uncool. But in order to give plantation owners and, and cotton field owners someone to use cheap, inexpensive labor, yeah. Europeans and the Americans went to Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, back then, when they did that, if you, if you take this, this timeline and this concept and reverse it a little bit and consider, okay, these cotton and sugar plantation owners, see them kind of like these gods from outer space. And they come down, they want to use the natural resources that we have. They want a cheap labor force. They have to find that labor force somewhere. So they look around where they are to indigenous life forms. We looked to Africa. Our European ancestors and American ancestors did not see the black race as being human. Right. They saw them more as being predominantly animal. And that is what led them to think that they could go ahead and own them like they own dogs or yeah, cats sure. or any other chattel, you know, donkeys, oxen. They go over to Africa. They grab these people who have no technology. They do not speak the same language. They, they do not have the same customs. They look inferior in every way, even though in their own culture they have, may have been very spiritually advanced or advanced in other ways that we as Europeans and Americans may not have been That's aware right. of, like Marketing. the American Indians, for right. instance. Um, <clears throat> you know, we get into the situation of judgment. You know, you're inferior, I'm superior, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you are. No, uh, It just all. means that you're more powerful and you can do what you want because you've got all the technology. So they go to Africa, they get these poor people, they destroy their families, they destroy their lives because they don't think they're human. They bring them over to their plantations. They use them for cheap labor, for cheap, you know, work. They drive them until they drop because it, it doesn't make any difference. There's more, they can get more. Mm -hmm. And then the plantation owners look at these people and go, hmm, we could breed with these. Right? That's right. They're human enough to be able to have sex with. That's right. And so they do. And there's this new group of people, this new breed of person who is now half black and half white. Exactly right. Half African and half European. And they don't fit in anywhere. They're still required to do the same kind of work, but, but philosophically, they, they know they're different. They don't want to be like their parents. They don't want to be slaves. They want what the white man has. They want the same equal, equal rights, you know. Oh, yeah. And so eventually, as more and more of this new, these new generations come into being, there's new problems that have to be dealt with. And eventually, the slave trade has to stop and the plantations and the cotton fields are gone because the old way of thinking about the person as being an animal has now been supplanted by the demigod sort of, you know, if you yeah. want to look at it like that. Yeah. The, the half-breed that is no longer illiterate, no longer a willing to be a slave. And I think that's very similar to what must have happened if, in fact, we had um, entities from outer space come down here and seed the earth with their own genetics, that um, there well, could be a number of us that are, you know, part of that genetic pool. And that would, you know, answer a lot of questions. A lot of things would be answered uh, with that scenario. If, 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 especially since, you know, still in, in our own lifetime, we see that there are many people who don't, do not accept black, mm -hmm. even though they're not at all the same people that came over here. They are more us than anyone else now. And 
You know, so it, it does. It leaves a lot of room for philosophical speculation as to what could have happened. We have done it ourselves. We cannot sit here and say it could not have been done by well, we've another. We've already done it ourselves to another culture. That's right. Let's take it from the other side, and let's suppose that maybe another culture came here that was superior, that was our superior on Earth, our That's human. Right. And just as we had a civil war to emancipate the new breed of black man, and they have now assimilated into our society, so could all these demigods, these, these half-breed alien uh, indigenous life form, you know, yep, con exactly right. conglomerations could have done the same thing. And, and if there was some sort of a <clears throat> cross-breeding uh, going on a long time ago with the indigenous or those creatures that were just here on Earth, and no matter, no, you know, that's a whole another story as to how those indigenous uh, Cro-Magnon or Peking Man or whatever those hominids were hundreds of thousands of years ago. Well, just but. anthropologically, <clears throat> the leap that we took in in chronologically a very short period of time oh, very, for very the short. evolution of man from an ape to Cro-Magnon Man, something incredible had to have happened genetically to have made that possible. Absolutely. The, the, the human creature on the earth today as we know it, our human beings today, when you go back into uh, archaeological and uh, paleontology history, ancient history, uh, you will see that there's for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years these hominids are all looking basically alike and all of a sudden out of nowhere pops up us that's right and we've got a far superior mind as humans today far superior uh, we're far superior in so many ways and yet inferior in that our bodies are, are, are a lot more frail uh, we're not able to to live as those ancient hominids did and we're just a totally different creature, though we, we look somewhat like their structure, but we're just a totally different creature, and we pop up humans out of nowhere. And I'm saying, and a lot of other people have theorized, could it be that there was, in fact, as the Bible says, come let us make man in our image. Uh, a very famous rabbi I knew many years ago said to me, now, when you read that particular scripture in Genesis where God said, Come, let us make man in our image, that was not saying, he says, go back and read it correctly. It was not saying that God was creating man. This is from a rabbi, a very yeah. high-ranking rabbi, as a matter of fact, from Massachusetts. And he says, uh, go back and read it. It does not say that God created man. If you read it correctly, it is saying that God said, Come, let us make man in our image. Yeah, more than one. Yeah. That's the plurality. And it was not the point. And the point was that it was not making man. It's re-making man. Mm -hmm. Make man again. This time, we're not going to make man. But we're going to make gonna man in that. our image. Mm -hmm. After our life. See, that's the problem with semantics. And that's the problem with with translation. I mean, you can, you can know, even in your own life, that if you told a story to one person and then had them tell that same story, which was from the horse's mouth, of course, within 15 minutes to 10 different people, by the time it got to the 10th or 15th other person, it would be, it would totally have the distorted. essence. Totally of the, the first story, but it would be totally different in content. Right, right. And, you know, that is the problem with dealing in translation from an original source. We have had so many translations, you know, from Hebrew to Roman to Greek oh, yeah. to English to, you know, on and on and on ad infinitum. So and not much to mention the fact lost. that there are that there are those uh, uh, private agendas, you know, that, that certain exactly. things have left stuff out. 
Plus, each person who sees something has a totally different perspective. If you have, for instance, a story about someone who is murdered in a particular way, and you pass it on, well, if, if you go along through those people, there's a good chance that there's one person in there who's going to have a bias one way or another mm -hmm. against either how it was done or whether or not it should be told or, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And so that is going to color the entire rest of the story. And it's not just because the person didn't want to say it, but perhaps they thought it was best not to let all the details out. Exactly. And I think that's what we have been subjected to a lot in in all of our history, you know, not just uh, talking about the Bible or mythology. So much is deleted and obscured and altered by changing hands and changing cultures and changing con conquerors. Every time a new conqueror comes along, you they delete history. history. Yeah. And erase people and erase kings. You know, I mean, look what, look what they've done throughout history. They've done this. You know, Definitely. we get what the agenda of the moment wants us to know. Right. I know. And, uh, and I, I believe that there is going to come a time when our, uh, our country, especially am I concerned about my own country, we're going to, as a people, have to come face to face with some pretty awesome truths and things which we have never been privileged to know about, we're not prepared to deal with, and uh, and I'm thinking that we're going to be faced with some very uh, profound situations very soon, because if I'm right, and there are in fact alien life forms here from other places, if there is in fact such a, uh, a scenario happening, Somewhere along the line, they are going to make themselves known, and we're going to have to come face to face with these, uh, with this other light that's here. Absolutely. And if they're superior to us, I would suggest that we better start finding out who they are and what they're doing here. Uh, I have an incident I want to tell you about real quickly. I did a program in Las Vegas many years ago, or, uh, well, not many, like about five years ago. Uh, a radio show. I did an interview and talked for a couple of hours, but I, I mentioned in passing on that show about five years ago that uh, about reptilian gods or ancient gods that look like reptiles. But after the program, I got a phone call from a man in Las Vegas who was telling me about an incident where uh, there were like five or six families. Uh, they were all Christians, incidentally, all Christian families, and this man was telling me the story that all six of these uh, Christian families, the, the men worked together and the company, they all worked at the same company and every year they'd take off on a vacation because they were all belonged to the same church. They were all friends, so they would take off on vacations together. And this particular year, and this is about four or five years ago on the radio, and so the, the, the guy called me after I was off the air and he called to tell me this experience where these uh, five or six uh, families have been uh, going out, uh, not mountain climbing, but uh, backpacking in Colorado on their vacation together. And he said they were up on a mountain one morning. They come up over a mountain one morning and look down in the valley. And we're talking about five or six Christian families here, men and women and children. And he says, and, and we all saw that there was a uh, ritual, some sort of a ritual going on in the valley that we had come up on that we were not expecting. And there was a large round area out in the valley. We were up on the mountaintop looking down. This large round area in the valley had been cleared away, and there was a round circle of people wearing uh, uh, robes, and they were swaying back and forth, holding hands and chanting. And there was obviously a priest or someone in the middle with a robe. And he said, we were pretty far away, but we weren't that far. We could see what was going on. And we, so he said, we told the children to be quiet and no one said anything because we realized we were interrupting some sort of a religious ritual or whatever. And he said, while we were standing there, in the circle appeared another entity out of nowhere. And it was much, much larger in size than everyone else that was there. And he said, the moment it appeared in that circle from out of nowhere, 
it pointed up at us, and the and the ritual stopped, the singing stopped, everyone pointed up, and we knew that we've been seen. And he said, so we were going. We figured we were, we were far enough away, up on the mountain, and they were out in the valley that, you know, they would never catch up with us. He said, we turned to run, and that entity that was in the circle was there within a few seconds. It confronted us. It came all the way across the valley and up the side of the mountain. It was not human. And he says, uh, there were six families here. We're talking about six Christian families with women and children. And he said, we all stood there and watched this thing and saw this thing. He said, it was well over seven foot tall. It was extremely muscular, uh, almost, uh, obscen- uh, almost an obscenity. It was extremely uh, muscular in, in, in uh, body form. He said, but it was like, it was designed like a, a male human. But it was totally filled with scales, and the head, this thing's over seven foot tall, the head was the head of a reptile. And he said, it, and it stared at us, and we could tell this thing was an extremely intelligent. It was not a, it was not a reptile in the normal sense. And he said, this thing stood there staring us at, at all of us. And he said, I was amazed. Even the children didn't cry. No one could do anything that was so frightened. He said, then... It finally decided that we were not uh, a threat to it, so it turned like it was going to leave, and then it stopped and turned back around and looked at the men, and it never said a thing. He said, but we could tell what it was thinking, that uh, that it was very unhappy that we had interrupted its ritual, and it was trying to decide what, what, what it was going to do about us. And he said, and it finally turned, and it, and it just a flip of an eye, he said, just a twinkle of an eye, it was gone things done and he said they went back down into the circle he said we took off running and no one said anything we just ran and ran and ran and he said so this morning when I heard you on the radio talking about reptilian gods he says I've got news for you they're still here we saw one and he said this thing was over seven foot tall this was uh, six different Christian families that were there together and saw it together and uh, so he says, so I am totally convinced that these things are in fact here and where they come from. He says that nothing in our Christian training prepared us for what we saw or what we experienced. So my point being is that I think that we had better start seriously looking at the possibility that this earth is being inhabited by other life forms than us. And we know that there's all kinds of life forms out there which are lesser uh, evolved than us, but I am suggesting that maybe we're not the highest evolved uh, you know, entities on this earth, and there may be others here with us. And um, I don't know exactly where they would have come from. I don't know what their agenda is, but I am uh, very highly suspect that there is the possibility there may be someone here. And, uh, and I think the military of, uh, of all the nations, especially the modern-day nations, know that. I know that our military is concerned about it. I know that there are other agencies of military throughout the government, throughout the world. So I know that there are some very high technical uh, organizations that are aware. And I'm just very concerned about what that bodes for the future for our country and for our world. Um, and that's why you know we could go on for another couple of hours talking about some of your experiences. Um, <clears throat> we have a little bit of time. Maybe if uh, Rod, do you would you like to take some phone calls, or do you? Yeah, I've got one on the line if you want to. Okay, let's do that. Okay, you're on the air. Hi, Rod. It's Neil here from State New York. Hi, Neil. Yeah, this is real fascinating stuff. The um, I particularly uh, was moved by her uh, story of the uh, eleven year old there. Yeah, I know. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah, there's been some pretty good research um, um, about some of these reptilians. Yeah. Of toys, uh, different names. They, as you indicated, they've been seen for thousands of years. Yes. And then uh, different cultures um, right up until the uh, present. It's interesting that some of the cave drawings seem to indicate um, different creatures. They're always considered to be some sort of archetype. Yeah. The American Indians, especially, have uh, many stories. I've heard many stories from American Indians about the 
they they know about the reptoids, the reptilian aliens, because they're out there on the deserts at night. They are out there. They call them space people. They they have a well, there's some really scary stories that the American Indians can tell you. That's really true. I, I know I became aware of uh, one Indian myth. I can't remember which group, but they're a local one that's, uh, from the L.A. area. And one of their old myths deals with reptilians living underground in the L.A. County area yeah. from many, many years ago, which in terms of, you know, where I experienced this thing, which was in Gardena, I mean, kind of corroborates that for me a little bit. But uh, American Indian mythology is rife with myths about reptilians, oh, yeah. as well as sky beings. So I've even heard uh, someone uh, that's in this field, an author in this field, had theorized, and it was a fascinating theory because I, I just I never thought about it. He said. Possibly, if, and we're just saying if, if there had been, say, uh, aliens from another place in our, in creation come here, say, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and they were reptilian, uh, or reptoids, or reptilians, perhaps they brought with them some of their uh, 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 pets. Maybe they brought with them some of the animals from their planet, and that would have given us the dinosaurs. Maybe they got here and were eating so well and grew and because of our atmosphere, and maybe those which we call the ancient dinosaurs and the ancient lizards uh, were actually brought here from another place. Um, it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting thought. Well, in Walter Cronkite's uh, series on dinosaurs, they project what the dinosaurs would have looked like if they had uh, continued their evolution. Oh, yes. The branches of it. Yeah, the uh, smaller, uh, smaller ones, and guess what they look like? Yeah, yes, <laughs> the reptilians. Absolutely, yeah, um, that's true. Th they weren't quite as muscular as your story indicates. Uh -huh. um, yeah, they had them being much leaner. But uh, sinewy. That I think it's just a bit of artist conception, like a kimono dragon, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But um, the the UFO related type research strongly indicates that you know they're subterranean creatures. The um, you know, the anecdotal evidence indicates that the um, that um, they're called Durakos, uh -huh. and that um, they're allegedly affiliated with a you know a warrior race, and they're meat eaters. You know, they're kind of like the tiger complex. They like their their food, scared and running. Yes. Yeah. And that they tend to feed off the uh, the, the, the energy grades to a lesser extent. They like the fear complex. They like to terrorize their victims. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Ryan. Also, you know, when I had that experience. Afterwards, I found that I wasn't frightened by it anymore. During it, it was very frightening. But I started thinking about it, and I thought, if that thing had really wanted me, it could have had me at any time. If it could get into my bathroom and my bedroom, you know, there would have been no problem. If it really had wanted me, what we ended up theorizing was that it was trying to scare my father away from something that he was working on, and that was the way they came up with doing it. Well, that makes sense to me, that it was merely trying to frighten him away. Right. And it did. It stopped every single thing that he was doing from that point on. And then you said that, the, the, that your father's demise was, was strange? Very. Can you talk about that for just a few moments? Um, sure. Uh, in 1964, my dad started having an ulcer problem that uh, was somehow related to a bullet wound that everybody said was impossible for him to have had uh, because he was never in combat. And anyway, he ended up going into uh, Balboa Navy Hospital after having a hemorrhage. And they did an operation, took a portion of his stomach out, and he was recovering for a while with no problems. And at, at the time, he was very, very upset. He was extremely agitated. I had told you earlier that he had been telling my mother that if he ever went into uh, the, any military installation for any reason where he was helpless, 
that he would not come out alive. Or the other scenario that he gave her was that they would re-induct him because of what he knew and that she would never see him again. And I heard them talk a number of times, you know. I was, I was young, I was 14, I wasn't totally conscious of the impact and the import of what they were talking about the few times that I heard them. But uh, I was always very, very aware of my father's fear. And uh, when he went into this hospital, it became even more evident because he started talking about it more. He didn't want my mother to leave his side. She had to know everything that they were doing, every procedure, what was going to happen, not to let them give him any medications that she didn't approve, on and on and on and on ad infinitum. And um, an interesting occurrence that I wasn't totally aware of at the time either until after I talked years later about it to my mother, was that a lot of the other high-ranking officers that were in the same ward that he was in started dying one by one. And they were all in the hospital for relatively minor complaints. And I think there were four, maybe five, including my dad. And my mother had been talking to all of these women, the wives of these different men, and within two week period, this whole ward was gone. Did they quickly sicken and die? Pardon? Did they quickly sicken? No, they had a in for a, you know, as your father was recovering, then all of a sudden take a severe relapse and very, very much so. It's like it he sounds was, like psychotronic or um, microwave weapons were used. He was so good one night uh, on a Friday. Just like we went off the cliff. home. It was the first time that we'd gone home in two weeks, and um, that was the 25th, I believe, of July, 1964. And we came back the next morning, and my father was in the intensive care ward. Yeah. And yet when I talked to him that morning, he seemed perfectly fine, but he was very agitated. He wanted to see my mother, and he kept saying, I saw something, Nancy, you've got to go get your mother for me right now. So I went to get my mother. She came back to talk briefly with my dad, and then she went away for a few minutes. By the time she got back, we were in the the waiting room, and you know they have the windows where you can see into the uh, the, the ICU. I think is what they call it. Anyway, all, all hell broke out in the ICU, where the entire two weeks that we were there, you could hardly find a doctor. You could hardly find an orderly. You could hardly find a nurse. All of a sudden, there were so many people in there that you couldn't you couldn't walk anywhere. And we tried, my mother did, tried to get through the door, and someone came and blocked her entry. And he, my dad was the only person in the ward, so what was going on we knew was happening with my dad. And she had told me right then, she said, your dad saw a bunch of lights and he was trying to tell me about it, and I, you know, she, she didn't get a chance to talk to him. So um, we were waiting there for a few minutes. A couple minutes later, a doctor came in and looked at my mother and said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Malone, uh, your husband has expired. And my mother looked at him in return in disbelief and said, what are you talking about? What are you saying? My husband has expired. What does that mean? And he, wouldn't, he would not say that my dad was dead. He said, your husband has expired, and he repeated it. And my mother went through the roof because, like I said, she was paranoid the whole time we were there. My dad was paranoid the whole time we were there. And she said, okay, fine. If, if he's dead, let me see the body. They said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Mrs. Malone, this is, it's against Army regulation. They would not let my mother in to see my father. My mother decided she would wait until the body got to the morgue. So we waited around a couple of hours. My mom's trying to think what could have happened, what she could do, what, you know, what the scenario is. Got down to the morgue. They would not let my mother see the body. We went home that afternoon. Somebody had ransacked our apartment, had taken every paper my mother had pertaining to my father that was in the apartment. Little did they know, my mother had a bunch of other papers at my aunt's house, but all of the papers that we had that were in the house were gone. All of his military papers. 
she started calling the army congressman anybody she could think of the hospital trying to tell people what was going on and that there was something screwy you know that she didn't believe it nobody would respond to her they just started threatening her after that we started getting lots and lots and lots of threatening phone calls two days later after she had made arrangements with the funeral parlor to uh, have an open cast funeral and they had agreed we go to have the funeral and they had a closed casket and my mother said what's going on here he said we're sorry we've been told by the military that you cannot have an open cast funeral so we went through the whole funeral process and after everybody had left and my mother and I were the only ones who were left there one of the workers we assume that was there one of the guys who you know takes care of the casket and everything going into the ground came up to my mother backwards very slowly and talked over his shoulder to her and said is that supposed to be your husband and she said yes there's no body To this day, we don't know what's happened. My mother tried to get the, an exhumation and was refused. And after we started getting all of the threatening phone calls and everything, my mother just got very, very frightened that something was going to happen to me because I guess they, they threatened my life to her. And so she became very, very low profile after that. And we eventually left. But before we left my mother left me at a friend's house saying that she was just going to be gone a little while because she had to think about things she was going to go to the beach my mother went to the beach she said she fell asleep on on the, the beach that afternoon two weeks later my mother came back to me and said that she just awoke on my mother lost two weeks of time I was stuck at a friend's house for two weeks right after my father died not knowing how much it was the worst time of my life I was so scared and after that my mother wouldn't talk about anything anymore we moved from place to place to place for the longest time and she went to look for an uncle of mine and he, he said he'd protect her and he lived with us me. and we eventually settled in Whittier, California but my mother went through some of the most horrendous things I could imagine anybody going through in their life after that happened. It was very bizarre. And we even saw a man after my dad had been supposedly buried. A man kept showing up across the street from our apartment for about a month after this happened. Looked so much like my dad except he had his hat pulled over his face and he was always standing in shadows but I saw him the first time about a week after it happened and I pointed him out to my mother and as soon as she, she swore it was my father and she tried to run across the street to go to him and the guy would take off but he kept showing up again and you know just at different places this man would be following us around and then one day he wasn't there anymore well it's quite a world we live in and uh Actually, we have just begun to scrape the surface of this subject. That, uh, because I know that Nancy and I have talked over the years, and we have so many more uh, stories and things which we need to talk to the audience about. We really don't have a whole lot of time left. Yeah, Nancy should get some missing time uh, therapy. There's a lot more there than what she remembers. Probably so. Well, I didn't have any missing time. That was my mom. Yeah, but what, what you're experiencing there, that uh, the uh, shadow of your father after the funeral, that um, that is common link with a lot of UFO contactees, sort of thing. Is it? You don't have to. You don't have to remember the missing time to be, be uh, involved in it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's very. Hopefully, you go there and they don't find a thing for you. If you find a good, competent, non-biased therapist, but I think you'll find that it might ease some of your pain give you yeah. more information, which is what you're looking for. Very well, could be. Very well, could be. Here's like I hope I'm wrong. 
Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your call. Thanks, Neil. And tonight I want to also thank Nancy for being with us because I have, uh, from the day I met Nancy, I knew that she was a very special lady, and she is. And uh, I, I know we'll have her back on because we've only just begun, believe me. Nancy and I have talked about many things over the years, and we've only just begun to, uh, to look at a very interesting life and some very important things that we all need to make ourselves uh, aware of.